Are you all comfortable sitting there? Do you want to be in closer? Um, we are going to film, um, and we're uh, we have a lot of people who want to be here, but are, they're out of state or they can't make it today. So they look forward to the videos that we've been posting on the website. Um, but we will um, keep all of your faces off of the film. It's just us um, that we're filming. If you're worried about that. Um, but the um, audio darm is recording, and also there will be an audio here, so any comments will be on the, uh, the recording. So I just wanted to make that disclosure up front. Uh, so if you're comfortable there, that's fine, or if you want to move closer. It's, um, all right. Okay, then we'll, we'll go ahead and get started then. Are you using them? Uh, I think so. Y yeah, is there a special? Is this... Is this working? Did you Just turn it on? I thought I... No, that's... Oh. Yes, <laughs> now it's working. <laughs> okay. We're live. Thank you for all coming today. It's good to see you here. And um, what we'll do is uh, we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves and then um, talk about what we're planning on doing today and then uh, get started with our our program. So my name is Jeff Harden and I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Insight World Aid. Uh, also I'm an emergency room physician, just a meditation instructor. I have a number of different hats and um, this is my partner in crime. So um, <coughs> I also offer my welcome. I'm Nancy Smee. And um, my primary career has been as a nurse midwife, uh, but then I went back and got my PhD and became a researcher and a professor. And um, so that is also what I do. And then I practice and teach yoga as well. And a, a, co-founder of Insight World Aid as well. And today, um, the, what we're, why we're gathered here is for um, what we're calling a symposium. <clears throat> That's kind of an interesting word. I, I looked up the etiology of it. It means to, to drink with. Uh, and it goes back to the times of the Greeks, so we're not serving any drinks, actually. Here. Actually, there's tea back there. Yes, there is tea. So. <laughs> but um, what we wanted this to be is really an uh, experiential um, discussion, really, of how uh, it is to be living at this time and to be, um, what, a patient, someone who has various degrees of health and illness, um, and also to be a caregiver and what that looks like in our modern technological world and how um, we can work with it uh, meditatively using the skills of mindfulness and compassion and um, also to keep coming back to the central um, theme that uh, self-compassion and, and self-inquiry are really essential I think to the healing process um, and really a big part of what um, both of us have learned about um, health and illness and, and uh, working at both as caregivers and care providers and also as uh, uh, patients and people who have their own health issues, I suppose. Did you want to say anything? No. Okay. So that's, that's was kind of our plan, but um, we'd be happy to hear from you and, and you know why you're here, or if there's anything, um, given that broad overview that you would like to get out of this, um, what brings you here today? And um, we don't. Uh, guess we for comments, I'd, we'd like to use the mic. So maybe I'll um, maybe you could do that if anyone wants to. Um, comment on why they're here today or what they would like to get out of this um, session. Good. Then I've been kind of forced 
forced into early retirement a couple of years early because of um, getting a cancer diagnosis towards the end of last year. And it's very early and supposedly cured and so forth. But that um, being on the other side and wearing the patient gown far more frequently than I uh, um, care to. <clears throat> um, really opened up my eyes as to what it's like to be on the other side, too. So, um, I guess I'm just here because the subject interested me. Um, as I look at not, probably not being able to ever work in the same capacity as I had in the past, um, I probably will be, um, doing some kind of volunteer work or um, something to, uh, there's a part of me that is, does want to contribute and felt that um, I was in my former job. So anyway, that's why I'm here. Thank you. <clears throat> Nancy will talk about um, her part in this circumstance. So I wanted to start with um, kind of a little experiment here um, called uh, Name Your Favorite Disease or, you know, speak to what um, illness maybe is near and dear your heart. If this is, if this is too personal or you, um, you know, you'd rather not say, but um, I'd like to just kind of create a little list of different things that are out there that, that you know, we're plagued with, that we, that we suffer from. Anyone? Uh, Mental illness. Mental illness, okay, yeah. And that takes on a lot of uh, different forms. Anyone else? Yeah, just, just, you just, you can just call them out. The big C? The big C. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we have a ringer here in the audience, somebody who's mm -hmm. life study and work is for, what's Heart that? Heart disease. Heart disease, yes, thank you. Huge 
diabetes. Diabetes, yeah. to do that as a kind of a, um, I don't know, a visual on just some of the things that we're, we're facing um, in our lives. And, um, you know, to a certain degree, these, these diseases can, um, well, certainly, they, I guess you could say, and it's up there, loss of independence, you know, they kind of can limit us and have a huge impact on the quality of our lives. And these are just also just diagnoses. <clears throat> um, you know, it's also kind of framed as uh, forms of suffering that we experience. And we're all, you know, these are, these are unique uh, manifestations that we have, but they're also um, something that we are all subject to. I mean, these bodies um, are amazing you know, we have, but they also um, they break down and they they uh, fall under the this way of these various um, different ways that the systems fail. Um, as uh, Hamlet said. Uh, this is the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that the flesh is heir to. So with with modern medicine, and you know, I'll just use that term, but it you know it has a lot of different terms, uh, meaning some people call it allopathic medicine or uh, mainstream medicine. You know, certainly there's different forms of um, medical care we can get in this society. Uh, from different types of traditional medicines and herbal medicines, acupuncture, osteop osteopathy, and chiropractor, and <clears throat> Tibetan medicine, and Alo Ayurvedic medicine are some of the different um, other schools. But um, what I have studied and what I know is modern medicine. I think most people who get ill in our society, you know, go to that first, and that's certainly, you know, the a big. Um, huge, uh, well, it's a, a medical industrial complex, really. There's a whole uh, huge amount of our gross national product that is spent in um, this healthcare industry that we find ourselves in. The, um, in addition to, um, I'm just kind of losing my train of thought here. I want to say that um, from the perspective of mainstream medicine, there are a lot of uh, treatments available. The 
the way mainstream medicine works, at least the way I was trained, is there's the disease model, uh, which is um, these are all diseases. They have a cause that can be known um, in some cases, in many cases, and then there can be interventions uh, in the biological processes that take place to uh, intervene with the, the uh, causative factor, the pathological factor, to affect a cure. And that's kind of what I learned in medical school, and that's probably goes back to the time of the Greeks, I would say. <clears throat> There's been a kind of a revolution over the last um, couple of decades of moving away from that. That's very, I think that's a very effective model for treating a lot of diseases, you know, diseases that have distinct causes such as injuries, infectious diseases. Uh, I would put in probably certain uh, forms of cancer, um, ways that we can understand the biology and intervene. There are a whole slew of uh, illnesses that are less successfully treated, I think, by um, modern medicine. And, and we looked at some of them, certainly the mental illnesses, some of the degenerative illnesses, and illnesses that have multiple causes um, or variable causes are a lot more refractory to being treated. And we're, and we're starting to see that. <clears throat> so um, with the uh, emphasis on treating the, the disease, one thing that sometimes gets left out is, is what the, the human, the person that has the disease is, um, you know, what, what is the quality of life? What is the value? What are their, um, the meaning for them? And uh, I think medicine is transitioning from a very paternalistic approach of um, the team, like not just the physician, but the team, medical team, uh, acting on a patient to get certain outcomes. And that we're seeing that as um, maybe a switch from the disease-centered view of, of uh, treatment to uh, maybe a person or a human or a patient centered view. There's also um, a growing recognition of the, the mind-body link, you know, that uh, these diseases, um, you know, even, even things like injuries or infectious diseases have, um, certainly there's this huge influence of our minds on our bodies. You know, some examples would be that people who are uh, under stress have suppressed immune systems, and that um, people who suffer from depression take longer to heal after major surgery. These are, these are some examples. Um, also, you know, a very common one that I think we all know experientially is that uh, fear decreases our uh, threshold for pain or, or, or our subjective experience of pain. Now, um, with um, also there's been a switch, I would say, from the goal being to cure disease, and this is this is still happening. Um, you know, certainly I think most healthcare providers want to cure disease, but a switch to um, maybe looking at the whole picture and being uh, we have this term palliative medicine now, which the goal is not so much to eradicate the disease, but to um, provide uh, really amelioration of the symptoms and of the suffering that, that is attendant with the diseases. So we're, we're seeing that shift too. And uh, you know, personally, as um, someone who's a care provider, health care provider, and also someone who has, had, I've had my own illnesses, I've um, <clears throat> and a meditator, and someone who um, teaches meditation, I've really kind of reframed, um, you know, what the goals of medicine are uh, for me. You know, they, the goals, of course, of the healthcare provider and the person receiving them sometimes are at odds, but they should, of course, you know, goes without saying, be um, geared towards the uh, the person who's receiving the healthcare. You know, and what their values in life, what they're looking. You know, oftentimes we can get. Um, treatment of disease and sometimes even cures, you know, maybe cancer might be a good um, example where there is, there can be, uh, you know, an uh, increase in uh, lengthening of life 
but not the quality of life can, can be um, sometimes problematic. So today, um, I want to, um, that's just kind of a theoretical background for saying, you know, so how do we get from all of this and living with these diseases and, and the, the suffering that um, comes with them, how do we get from there to actually, um, you know, and a lot of these, you know, really can't be cured, right? Um, I mean, I guess stress could be cured <laughs> if we just kind of uh, step back from our busy lives. But, you know, a lot of pain syndromes can be ameliorated with medications and, and lifestyle changes and, and um, what's called adjuncts. That is, other forms other than medications, other forms of treatment. Um, I think some of these are chronic and progressive diseases that can't be cured. So we live with them. And how can we use uh, meditation, really, as a way to um, be an ally in treating um, or living with uh, illness? And uh, that's what we're I'm going to talk about. And um, from my perspective, and Nancy's going to give you her perspective in a little bit, it uh, really comes down to two fundamental aspects, and that is um, kind of a marriage between uh, Mindfulness and compassion. You know, mindfulness is um, uh, basically a awareness of what's happening in the moment in our bodies and our minds, really our experience. And compassion is is the kind and caring um, confrontation or awareness of suffering that's present in that moment. So, really, these two uh, I think are an integral part of of whether we're being um, effective caregivers or, or, or facing an illness. And um, there's something about just um, the, the, you know, that's the theoretical aspect of, of mindfulness and, and, you know, and actually in practicing it, we, you know, here at IMC and, you know, a lot of us who do mindfulness meditation um, develop the skills in a formal way through a sitting practice, sitting meditation practice, and then also in our life, your, our daily life. So we want to um, uh, kind of build this muscle of being aware of things. You know, usually we have a lot of filters, and especially with illnesses, we can, we can develop a whole persona around our illness. You know, I am the person with, I don't know, chronic back pain, or I, you know, I, I myself had a uh, open heart surgery two years ago, had an airway valve replacement. And there can be a whole uh, series of stories around, you know, what happened, why, why me. Um, there can be uh, a lot of ideas, um, a lot of fear and anger, you know, some grieving processes perhaps from how life used to be, a loss of, of function. And um, all of that is really attendant, I think, with any, any disease. But what the mindfulness, what we aim to do is to really see that there's the experience. You know, for me, in, sitting in the hospital post-op day two, um, having severe pain, I was just, you know, kind of really contracted around that pain. And, um, you know, there's medicines that, you know, helped out quite a bit. Uh, but um, in that moment, even though I, you know, there's fear and is this ever going to stop and you know why me and all of these these stories, there was also these moments of, of insight of saying, okay, this is this is changing. A lot of, of mindfulness meditation has to do with observing change. This is changing and it's you know and I, I so it was kind of this dance of being stuck and mired in this this really suffering situation to breaking free of it at times. And I really attributed that to many years of practicing and, and you know going into it uh, open minded. So um, we're going to do in a few minutes. I just want to make sure we're keeping to our schedule. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing good. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to do a, uh, a guided meditation here and then uh, some discussion around that. But um, the other piece I wanted to say about, um, and I believe you're going to talk a lot about compassion. Is it your piece? or? Yeah. Um. Actually, sure. Feel free to. I'm going to talk about uh, primarily being a caregiver and developing compassion and what that means in terms of caregiving. Um, so. Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm more of the piece about being the patient or, you know, the perspective of, of being, uh, you know, because I think we're all both, you know, um, whether we're not professionally trained and we're caring for a loved one or, you know, raising children or, you know, whatever capacity of caregiving takes in our life, um, we're caregivers and we also are ones who um, will have uh, faced some of these conditions or some of our own. <coughs> So um, that's what I had to say about mindfulness, that the, um, this is a real skill that can bring us into the moment, let us see through some of the add-ons, you know, in addition to the exact, this, the pain of the experience or the limitation, there's these, this add-on that's occurring to see through that at times and then to, to break free of that. Um, that's really the, the practice. And it, of course, it's easier said than done, especially if you're in severe pain or there's been a, a, a condition you've been with for many years and have suffered from that and uh, have uh, um, had to, you know, re reorganize your, your life and, you know, some of the goals that were uh, available are no longer available. <clears throat> uh, let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to say about that. Are there any um, questions or any comments that I'd like to make at this point before we go into our meditation? Yes? All those things that are listed on the board there are like, are they, in terms of your knowledge, are they uh, modern day problems that they didn't, they didn't really exist, maybe that much? people live longer, we see a different mix of diseases. So, um, you know, with antibiotics, we've primarily taken care of a lot of the infectious disease problems that people died from. But now as people grow older and older, cancer, um, heart disease, these sorts of things show up more than um, in a society where people die in their 50s or early 60s. Also, prior to the discovery of insulin, uh, diabetics would die 
probably younger than um, they would be able to pass their genes on. So some of these are genetic diseases. And likewise, I know your um, the incidence of cancer increases quite a bit with a brief uh, guided meditation and um, you can sit in a chair whatever is comfortable very important uh, with any sort of meditation is to get into a posture that's both comfortable but alert that balances uh, energy with relaxation and if it's comfortable you can close your eyes just take a moment to maybe drop away from all the theory that we've been talking about and check in for a moment with how things are for you in this moment. What's going on in the mind and the body? that the mind wanders off the breath. Acknowledge that. Let it be. And return the awareness to the sensations of the breath. Bring it back to the breath. 
being present and letting be. As part of the experience of being mindful of the in and out breaths, there's this aspect to breathing that is constantly in flux, is it's impermanent, it's always changing. Breaths are not alike and they're always moving. Of the breath, it can be helpful rather than getting into a struggle, is to have some of that compassion, self forgiveness. that the mind's a little settled. I'm going to have you move your awareness into the whole body. This part of this body is the mind, connected and linked. And reflect on how your experience is in this moment. What is going on in the body and the mind? So many different sensations, maybe pressure, tingling, warmth or coolness, maybe experience of pain or numbness. Spend a few moments sensing into the phys physical sensations of the body.
as you're doing that, do you notice anything happening in the mind, any thoughts or emotions connected, any, maybe some stories about the body and the experience? See if you can acknowledge that. Whatever is your experience in this moment, acknowledge and let be. As you're exploring your body and mind in this moment, if something calls to you from your past, some aspect of maybe your health, your well-being, something, aspect of your body, maybe some illness or how it was different in the past and that's coming to your awareness, See if you can acknowledge that too and allow that to be present. We can notice these sensations in the body, the movements of the mind. These two are in flux and constantly changing, nothing standing still. Always ephemeral, always impermanent. few moments in the meditation, and return again to the sensations of the in-breaths and the out-breaths, allow the body to relax, sense into the feelings of breathing.
now before I ring the bell to indicate the end of the meditation, take a few moments to congratulate yourself for taking this time to nurture yourself, to reconnect with the body and your mind, and to be present for yourself. to do now is, um, if, if you'd like, to break into groups of three. We have just the right number, but if you feel like you need to sit this out for whatever reason, that's fine. Um, but uh, no one should feel obligated to participate. Um, but what I'd like to do is to have groups of three just kind of discussing um, on whatever level you feel comfortable with, um, either this meditation that we just did or some experience that you've had uh, dealing with illness, um, dealing with this body and mind that we seem to be randomly assigned to <laughs> um, and learn, have to learn how to work with. And um, specifically what I would like to uh, focus on is um, what is your own experience of your body and mind, um, either in the moment or in a particular aspect, and then how you've worked with it meditatively or how you, um, maybe in this exercise we just did, how you've been able to um, uh, understand it or be experientially connected to, to the, the body and mind. So those are the two questions. What is the experience and then how, how to work with it with mindfulness. And what I'd um, like to propose is rather than have an open forum is that each person take time let's say about uh, four minutes to discuss that uh, from their, their own perspective and the other two can listen mindfully and just be present and you know if the mind wants to uh, interrupt and offer a solution or uh, make a commentary just notice that and, and you know it's probably easier to not have that feedback here we'll um, to just speak to our own experience and, and listen and then as a person is speaking they can also be mindful of What's going on in the body and mind? It's a practice, really, 24/7. So um, we can just uh, do that. And, I, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep time every four minutes. I'll ring the bell to switch, and we'll go through each of the three people. And then um, after that, we'll uh, gather back you know, before our break. So you can grab your neighbor and go across the room, whatever or so now for a larger discussion uh, before we have a, a, a period of break. And um, I invite anyone who'd like to, to comment on their experience. Probably best not to comment on your <laughs> partner's <laughs> experience, uh, but to speak you know, from first person if you wish, or something else around this topic that you'd like to um, speak out or ask. Discuss here the larger group. Was the um, for me since I've um, learned this technique or discovered this technique through practice and all that, to me the, the, the biggest positiveness is the source of comfort when I'm able to connect my my thoughts or my anxiety or my pain or whatever it is with the body sensation at that particular point. It doesn't happen all the time, but whenever it happens, it's a very good source of comfort for me and, and I seem to get strengthened that to be more balanced or poised to move on. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. I, I think that's a very common experience that, you know, to actually re-embody or connect with the body can be very comforting.
comforting and soothing. Even even in the face of parts of the body that may be screaming out in pain, there can be some alleviation. into your daily life and you know it sounds like you will have a whole toolbox full of things I you know I didn't give the instruction of putting your hand on your heart but that's a wonderful a lot of people do I do that and it's just a wonderful way when things are you know we never know what's going to happen when we close our eyes but when things are spinning out of control to be able to soothe yourself in that way I'm also wondering if um, if you have ever done that with a very anxious patient that's <laughs> just what they are Put, no, the put hand your hand, hand. on oh. their heart. Oh, so that can work really well. Yeah. You know, I know it works yeah. very well with yeah. babies that mm -hmm. are very upset to just put mm -hmm. your hand over their heart. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
instead of um, is not to add any judgment. Um, instead of trying to force myself to get back to that peaceful state to calm down and all that, I really just sit with my busy mind. Um, and it actually turned into an investigation. There's a lot of emotions there that I didn't understand. But you know, by not having a judgment over time, I actually was able to understand all of this la layers of the real emotions. Um, and also with that, it's actually in some ways kind of interesting. It helped me calm down in a different way that um, I was able to go back to my breath a lot of time. And that's always very soothing. You know, that's actually um, is the form of concentration for me, being able to just focus on my breath. And well, of course, you know, and it goes back to this chat in my mind again, but that's okay, it's a kind of process. It just repeats itself over and over. But this uh, non judgmental attitude, is, I found it extremely helpful, and I was able to do more meta for myself as well. Thank you. Just 
uh, he addressed every sloth and powerful problem, every aspect. And please, if you have that problem, issues and the goal for it, it just one right so thank for his uh, his idea on how to deal with it. And but I I sleep I still mm -hmm. <laughs> because yes I still did not solve all, all together yet. Thank you. But instead I'm doing um, walking meditation. So why don't we take um about 10 minutes, and uh, if you need to use the restroom or get a drink or stretch the legs, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back here in 10 minutes for Nancy's presentation and a guided discussion. Some of the pain surrounding caregiving for his brother who died of pancreatic cancer, and um, this was six years ago. And he actually broke down sobbing there in the cafe. And he, his, his query to me was, do you suppose I have this much suffering still around this? And it came down to that he was there for his brother. He spent a lot of nights with his brother in those last days. He was the person who comforted his brother a lot, but his sadness was around the times that he ran away from it, or left, or couldn't deal with it. And I said, well, what, what was the feeling? And he said, the feeling was fear. And I asked him what specifically he was afraid of. And he said, I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to do the right thing in that moment. And his brother, he said he was wild, you know, the pain medicine would wear off and he would, he was overloaded with fluid, uh, he was swollen, he was um, kind of out of his mind and he was trying to pull out IVs pull out cath his catheter. Um, and he said, that really frightened me a lot. So there was a lot of suffering around that. My own experience around being a caregiver, um, you know, most of my career has been in women's health, delivering babies, um, working with women in their health care needs and problems. And for the most part, that's a pretty happy, joyful um, career path. But um, in obstetrics, when things start to go wrong, they go very wrong. And, um, and then it's very sad. And it's very disastrous. So I remember um, one case, one stillbirth that I delivered. And, um, and I'll, I'll just share with you because this is, the, this is the poem that I wrote after that experience, um, trying to process my own feelings. So this is called Lost. I delivered a stillborn today six weeks shy of its full gestation, floppy and limp like a macerated rag doll. On the death certificate, I called it a stillbirth, but this was not a quiet demise, for this child had a howling face, bloody tears, and floated out in bowel-emptied putrefaction. There was a struggle, all right, around its wrist, twice wrapped tightly its lifeline. Like me, did it raise its fist in anger and shake it against the dark loneliness of the night sea? Or was it merely seeking its sucking thumb for comfort? 
My heart donkey box at this heavy hall of false starts and missed birthdays. Wilderness way walking requires sure-footedness and my legs are very tired. So this was not the last stillborn that I delivered. When I was in Zimbabwe working with HIV-infected women during their pregnancies, um, there were many stillbirths that I delivered there. And this probably, um, during that time, uh, and the whole AIDS epidemic and experiencing there, it there, a country that is, has been very hard hit, <clears throat> was where I first came into real uh, cognition of, um, of this idea of compassion fatigue. Because among my co-workers, among the doctors and the midwives there, uh, there was absolutely nothing left, they told me. They were dealing with patience and loss at work, but when they went home, their family members were also infected and dying. A whole generation, middle generations, were being lost, leaving grandparents to tend, you know, five, six, seven grandchildren and the thought of raising them as well. And, um, and so I think as care providers, whether we're doing it for our families, for our friends, um, or whether we're doing it professionally, this fatigue that can take us over is very real. Um, and, and I think it's worth it to spend some time looking at how do we cope with compassion fatigue. I'm a great one that um, when I have questions about things, I look for models. And so I, um, I started searching the literature for some models surrounding this. And one of the, the models, of course, that I looked at was Western medicine, or as Jeff explained, modern medicine or allopathic um, medicine. And, um, and he did a very nice job of, of explaining this mind-body um, duality that occurs in Western medicine. And this split that dates back to the Greek time, Plato um, was responsible for describing this and probably then in the 16th century with Descartes, it really got solidified. Um, and so medicine has forever forward taken this approach, that this rational, scientific approach. Um, Christianity has perpetuated that Often we see the body at, in Christianity and in the, some of the, um, the Judeo-Christian traditions as the enemy to um, the soul or uh, to the spirit. And, um, and so how do we, how do we really um, avoid this just chasing the disease. You know, organs become diseased, but people experience illness. The person becomes ill. So, um, so how do we stay in contact with that person? Um, an English uh, 
a medical educator has rightly said that the secret of the care of the patient is to care for the patient, um, not the disease. And, um, and so I would echo some of Jeff's concern um, that he brought up surrounding that. And, um, and we, get, we get caught in that. So if this is true, um, if, if we need to really focus on the person of the patient, then I ask myself, okay, so which profession is seen as doing this most compassionately? You know, which, com which profession? Is it the clergy? Is it physicians, teachers, you know, psychologists? Who does this best? Well, there are all kinds of polls and, um, you know, surveys and research on this. But interestingly, nurses are identified as um, the most compassionate caregivers they also score the highest in terms of ethics and, um, and trustworthiness, ability to trust them. I found that very interesting. They get an 80%. Um, physicians, and, um, physicians and teachers get 75, uh, get uh, 65%. Pharmacists, interestingly, get 70%. Uh, policemen are down around um, 55%. Lawyers, we don't want to do any bashing here, but lawyers are down right around 15%. Uh, congressmen are at 8%. And lobbyists are at 4%. <laughs> so um, just, just a little interest. So good, nurses are at 80%, but the good news, bad news in this story is uh, nurses also have a third of nurses leave the profession within five years. Now that doesn't mean that they just change jobs or that they leave their first job in nursing. No, they leave the profession completely. So there's a problem here. They're, they're scoring high with patients, but the retention, they're not staying in the job. Um, so that's, that's a, maybe not such a, a good model. Those who actually, so then this, you know, what I'm doing is I'm establishing my trail of, um, you know, looking at all these questions that come up. So the nurses uh, who actually do the best at staying in their job are those who are able to balance engagement and detachment. So maybe we need to look at that as a model for caregiving. So caregivers who can do this, who are able to um, balance engagement and detachment, they are the best able to affect outcomes without needing to control them. Okay, doesn't mean they're, they're control freaks. They can affect outcomes, but they don't need to control them. They're also found to be the ones who are most pragmatic. So they come from a standpoint of do what works. Um, they make conscious choices based on their own emotional needs as well as the patient's needs. So they do take into effect their own emotional needs. They set and maintain limits and boundaries for their uh, career actions. 
and they practice self-care more effectively than their co-workers who end up leaving the profession. And they're therefore less susceptible to burnout. So that's, um, that's something, something to think about. So self-care, and I talk to my students always a lot about this that we have to, in order to take good care of others, we have to take good care of ourselves. So these models all sort of speak to the conventional wisdom about caretaking. Um, you know, they help us with things like timeline, um, deadlines, they help us with things like productivity, the demands that we have to be uh, more and more and more productive. Um, they help us somewhat with uh, all of the regulations that as professional caregivers we face. Um, and as um, caregivers for our families, we're juggling many balls, you know, we're, we're juggling the balls of the people who are healthy in our families, we're juggling our own self-care, and we're juggling those who have the special health needs. But what about, um, what about transcendent models? What about spiritual models? What about um, the truly compassionate, uh, things that can help us. So for that, I, I actually went um, looking back at a model that, um, that I like a lot. And in Buddhism, in Mahayana Buddhism, this is the Bodhisattva model. Avalokiteshvara, the one who has many arms, many eyes, <coughs> sees all of the suffering and has all of these hands to be able to intercede for this suffering. Um, the Bodhisattva is the, uh, is the awakened person who, um, well, I'll just, I'll read it for you because I think um, Reb Anderson says it very well here in his uh, being upright on uh, Zen meditation and the, the um, Bodhisattva precepts. So he says, in order to benefit all living beings to the fullest extent, Bodhisattvas vow to enter the limiting, often painful ways of the conventional world to accomplish them thoroughly and then by understanding their ultimate significance, transcend them. Bodhisattvas further vow that after realizing transcendent liberation, they will go, they will let go of the ultimate and return to the conventional world, join hands with all beings and walk together with them through birth and death. As the traditional saying goes, they go up and attain awakening, and then they come down and transform beings. Their vow is to continue the cycle until all animate and inanimate beings throughout the universe are restored to blissful peace and harmony. For a bodhisattva, the bright red thread of the vow of compassion runs through the conventional and the ultimate truths. The vow guides and protects the bodhisattva in all modes of practice and in the transitions between them. The power of the vow rescues those on the solitary peak and sends them back into the wild seeds of caring for others. 
If they have fallen into the wild seeds, then the vow raises them up to the summit of the solitary peak. So this model of the Bodhisattva um, brings up some questions for me. And, and as I, you know, engage with you in this symposium, I don't have answers. We're here to do this together. But the kinds of questions that I have about being a caregiver is where is the interface between my human frailties, in example, my fatigue, and that transcendent ideal of compassion, of um, really coming from a place that is um, awakened, how do I keep sight of the bodhisattva inside of me with the financial pressures that work um, imposes, with the time and productivity pressures, with the regulation demands uh, that malpractice realities impose, on medical providers, and um, and just with the way that medicine is practiced today, which is very defensively. How does the care provider hold the paradox of the needs to practice evidence-based medicine and at the same time acknowledge and honor the uniqueness of individual personhood in the care plan. So what I'd like to do for the next several minutes is again have you break up into your groups. And it might be helpful since you now have some comfort with those three people um, to break up into the same groups. And um, what I would like you to do, and we'll, we'll just uh, we'll do the same thing. Um, in fact, we have time. So uh, let's, let's take the minutes, those um, four to five minutes, to share in the groups your own questions and experiences surrounding what it means for you to be a care provider and what your personal struggles, questions, frustrations might be with that. And then we'll, we'll come back and join together. OK? Sharing as co-caregivers. Um, what that's really like. Do you, do you want to be the runner? It's pretty lovely. Thank you. One of the things I was uh, commenting on that's, that's helped me as a caregiver, and I'm, a, I'm a professional, I'm a physician, is to, um, you know, it was interesting as you were commenting on the different individuals in the, in the, um, the respect that they have, and to try to bring all those things together, I think one of the one of the challenges that I found is um, providing care can be a very lonely process, and, uh, and especially when it doesn't go well, and, and, and to try to share that as a as a team and to share that as a group and to bring together the talents of individuals uh, in, in a group process, um, I think helps. It certainly has helped me as a as a caregiver to bring in nurses, to bring in pharmacists, to bring in social workers to bring in nutritionists and to really have a team concept that provides care. I think it helps the individual uh, providing the care. I also think that the patients that I've served have um, had a better experience in that way. Um, so I think that process of sort of diffusing the, uh, maybe the responsibility, if you will, and, the, and to work together as a group to try to find um, ways to uh, provide the compassion, help each other out as well, to help each other when we're all um, uh, 
uh, suffering and we're all uh, having a difficult time with the, say, a difficult patient or patient's not doing well has been a, a process that's been uh, effective in my life. Great, and, and you know, you're right on target, of course, with this multidisciplinary teams. Um, this is all of us who are professional caregivers know that that's the impetus. So, yes, fabulous resource that sometimes we overlook when we just get stuck in our own little groups. parents in their uh, getting to be in their late 80s and um, I seem to be the one in my family I have four sisters and uh, um, I'm the one in the family doing most of the caregiving but I'm getting them more involved and um, you know I'm working on finding that balance between taking care of myself and also helping helping them and I have been, you know, trying to let go so that, um, and not be as available and, um, you know, really um, showing my sisters that they need to contribute and they are contributing more. And um, I think just backing off myself and, you know, just letting go also and trusting that they can take care of them too. And um, yeah, so I'm just, in the process of finding that, that balance of taking care of myself, um, but also, um, uh, you know, showing compassion for them and caring for them. Do, does guilt come up around that, or did it initially? Um, well, I, I started feeling resentful, and I, you know, that wasn't a good idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that I started feeling resentful. Um, that I started giving up. I was giving up things I wanted to do uh, in order to, you know, take them to a doctor's appointment or take my mom to a hair appointment. And I realized that no, I can't do that. I still got to live my life and have my own life. And uh, um, and um, so. I have one sister who lives very close, and she's really stepping up to the plate. And so it's more the two of us are more involved. But uh, you know, I, I'm making sure the others, you know, like my mom had, she has macular degeneration. She had to go to these, get a shot in her eye every six weeks, and I just, I told her I couldn't do it. And so uh, my oldest sister. Um, uh, my mom actually called her and asked her to take her. I said, Mom, you know, can you ask her? I can't do it. And so now my sister's doing that. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah. and 
um, all the things that is going on in the rehab center, all the noise and all the people and all of that. Um, no matter how I try, I just can't find a balance. So I feel like I'm kind of going out on a limb and just wondering when I'm going to crash. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, one thing that I would say is, um, and that I think is important, I would really like to acknowledge that um, need for quiet time. Um, are you an introvert? Yes. So um, I am too. And, um, and sometimes I feel a little guilty about how much alone time I need to feel good. Uh, but that's where my stimulation comes is my mental inner life and the outer life is often very overstimulating. So um, there's, I don't know if you've seen this book that came out in the last year or so called Quiet. Um, it's a very wonderful book, quite well written, quite well researched about introverts and the, it's um, it's the subtitle is the power of the introvert in a world that can't can't stop talking um, and it's very good and um, so if you need that part of yourself acknowledged and valued um, I can recommend that book to you but um, what I, I don't have an answer, so I would open it back up to all of you. We have a whole room full of caregivers. Um, what, what do you have to say for her? I um, spent close to 40 years being a nurse almost all of the time in ICU. Um, and I found that you know, working really long shifts and then sometimes I came home and it, you know may have to go back to work the next day. But I'm very fortunate. I live on top of a hill close to here and close to the top of the hill surrounded by nature preserves. And there's a place that I love to walk to that's maybe a 15 or 20 minute walk away. And I would go out there at night and face the west and be able to look at the Santa Cruz Mountains. And sometimes fog would be rolling in, or I would, you know, I could feel wind on my face and blowing through my hair um, right next to um, several eucalyptus trees. And for me, um, I'm not a very successful sitting on the cushion meditator. I'm much better in nature. Mm -hmm. And in those kinds of situations where I can just really hook into the physical sensations, what I hear, um, you know, any, and do I see any animals? Are there any deer? Are there birds? Sometimes there are owls hooting. Um, looking up at the star, stars, or what's the phase of the moon? Um, I I do that a lot, and I actually think my particular um, my diagnosis um, that my job very much um, contributed to me getting cancer. And um, so for me, this last year when I haven't been working, it's been a lot more focusing in on healing and finding healing. And I think it's really important. Um, all of us in our busy lives can really lose contact with what we really need. If you believe we have spirits, I don't know what that is, but I think that there is a part of us that really needs connection with nature or creativity or I'm hoping there's some way you can find some time to do that. Um, I just want to make a comment. I'm an introvert and I have read that book. I thought it was excellent. It really helped me understand myself better and that you know, introverts 
paper is recharged by being alone. So it's okay, and if, you know, you need that time to recharge, and you know, just, it is important. That's just that I need a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody, it, you know, if you need a lot, you need a lot, and that's okay. that's a huge thing and that commute would be exhausting and um, the other thing and this may kind of go against the grain of introverted advice but I think there are um, for the type of care I, there are support groups actually and I think even if a person's introverted sometimes there's just I, I think it can be a very isolating experience to be a caregiver and very very unique especially with the parent I think an older parent, I think there are some very unique issues that come up. And I think it can be really um, cathartic even for an introverted person to go to these groups maybe just once a month or twice a month or something um, and to have a chance to talk with people that are also going through a very similar experience. So. Thank you. Excellent suggestion. boy and genius boy and uh, 
uh, everything, but uh, in, uh, in retrospect, then I, I am looking back, I am having the feeling of sorry to him, you know, a lot to him. Actually, he had a, he had a second child, had born last October 1st, when, when uh, the second girl was born, uh, his wife had born a uh, second child this October 1st, very healthy, and she didn't have any injection or anything. But I, when I was uh, a child born, was, I was bad. I just, that much, uh, I didn't have strength. So one is congratulation. Then. <laughs> I realized that um, part of my anxiety or all of these things going on is my is that I don't trust the professionals that are caring for her. And no offense to all the healthcare professionals on the, in the audience. Yeah. Um, it seems uh, this is kind of what I'm seeing in the um, uh, healthcare system that when she needed a lot of care, you know, she went from the ER to the neuro ICU, the care was fantastic. I could trust, you know, I, I can, if I go away for a whole week, I can trust that they really take care of my mom and everything. So it was like a five-star hotel. And then as she needed less monitoring, you know, going from the neuro ICU to the transition ICU to the regular room, and now in the, this rehab center, which is off the hospital, which kind of went to one star. And I feel that I couldn't really trust these people at all. Um, uh, well, sure enough, there, there, there was a reason why I couldn't trust them because my mom fell down. And uh, who knows if she would hit her head again and have another hemorrhage, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so that really added to it as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really appreciate everybody's um, input on, you know, um, some of these things I've, I've been thinking about too, but then, where to let go, you know, and start trusting other people to help her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, working with these things. That's a tough one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything that they want to share about their experience in caregiving? Okay. Um, well, then um, what I would like to do is just have us finish with a little bit of a guided meditation for a few minutes. So maybe just take a comfortable upright or reclining position, whatever is best for you. Just start to settle deeply into the body again. Maybe a little rocking back and forth motion to find that place where you're centered. Where the breath flows most effortlessly. your body's participation this afternoon in this event, its support and strength for your being here.
perhaps also acknowledging any fatigue that is there. Where you feel it. What those sensations in your body are. Maybe also acknowledging if there's any fear or any frustration surrounding caretaker responsibilities, demands, time pressures. Acknowledging that everyone here in the room, as they've shared today, experiences their own fears, frustrations, fatigue. And sometimes not being up to the job caretaking, whether it be professional or for loved ones. Just taking a moment here to acknowledge that reaching the limits of our practice of compassion as a separate personal activity makes us more ready to receive help from the compassionate realms beyond our discriminating awareness.
connection between the conventional truth and the ultimate truth through this practice of compassion that is coming forward through us. Thank you all. I'm going to turn the mic back over to Jeff now. Looks like we'll um, finish a few minutes early. Um, really enjoyed your participation and coming out today. We, um, I think a lot of you know we have a Insight World Day being the we in this sense are planning our first trip to Cambodia. And I know several people here are uh, signed up or planning on signing up. So that's very uh, heartening to get to know you better and spend some time. Uh, if you haven't looked at our table yet, we have some literature there. We have a fundraising campaign. We're partnering with a larger uh, group of volunteers, Cambodian Americans actually from Long Beach, who will be going to um, do all of the orchestration and we'll be kind of going along with them, but providing teachings on mindfulness and